Libraries are filled with books that have proven to be some of the greatest literary works of all time. Books like Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn have mesmerized readers for decades. Other works much older than Lee's and Twain's have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with modern manuscripts and emerged as timeless literary giants. Dante's The Divine Comedy and Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet are but two. But there are other literary masterpieces that are not traditional forms of literature, like the diary of Anne Frank, a series of journal entries by a young Jewish girl living through the Holocaust, or Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech that helped unify a divided nation. Great literature can be found in many varied forms, including journalism. Join me as I examine some journalistic writings that have attained the rank of great literary works of art. I'd like to examine some amazing articles published by writers that turned what could have been an ordinary news story into timeless literary masterpieces. They each use certain proven elements that when combined produce works that far exceed the average newspaper article. One such element is that any work that hopes to become a masterpiece must have something about it that's relatable to those that read it. In his Nobel Prize for Literature acceptance speech, writer Orhan Pamuk said, A writer talks of things that everyone knows. My confidence comes from the belief that all human beings resemble each other, that others carry wounds like mine, that they will therefore understand. A wonderful example of this type of sentiment can be found in an article written in 1935 by then-journalist Richard Wright, Wright wrote of the inescapable joy of African Americans after Joe Lewis beat Max Baer to become the first black champion boxer. Wright wrote, and the whites and the blacks began to feel themselves. The blacks began to remember all the little slights and discriminations, and the whites began to search their souls to see if they had been guilty of something, sometime, somewhere. Excerpts like those foster a feeling of relatability by all readers. Every reader could find something of themselves in Wright's piece. Another essential element of great writing is that it must paint a picture for the reader. It must be descriptive. Without the visual effects that can be employed by movies and television, writing could prove dull and uninspiring. But a good writer can make his text sing and dance, and the reader feels he's lost nothing but gained entry into another world. In 1595, Sir Philip Sidney wrote that good writing doth grow in effect into another nature in making things either better than nature bringeth forth or quite anew. Joseph Addison echoed that analysis more than a hundred years later when he wrote, Words, when well chosen, have so great a force in them that a description often gives us more lively ideas than the sight of the things themselves. Both authors understood that to truly create a masterpiece, the words must be graphics that allow readers to see and hear the story unfold. A wonderful example of descriptive writing can be found in an article written in 1923 by Lorena Hickok about seeing the train that carried the body of President Harding. She writes, The long moaning whistle around the bend, the blinding shaft of light down the glittering rails, the roar and wind and trembling of the earth, the breathless wait for the rear car, the flashing vision of wreaths and flags and rigid figures in khaki, the red tail lights vanishing like pinpoints in the dark. Yes, it was worth waiting for. Now let's talk about an intangible element that makes for great literature, the indomitable human spirit. This element transcends language and genre and appeals to any reader. When accepting the 1962 Nobel Prize for Literature, John Steinbeck said, The writer is delegated to declare and to celebrate man's proven capacity for greatness of heart and spirit, for gallantry and defeat, for courage, compassion, and love. When a story focuses on the determination and strength of powerful characters, readers immerse themselves in the story. A glaring illustration of human courage and compassion is a news article written by J. R. Moringer called Crossing Over. It's a story about an old woman named Mary waiting for a river ferry that would bridge the worlds of the whites and blacks of G's Bend, Alabama after decades of separation. 
Over and over, Moringa writes of how Mary and the players in her story rally against dejection and tragedy to survive. One such passage tells of how Mary fled an abusive marriage years before. Moringa writes, Mary Lee misses Reuben, but not those beatings. Once, Mary Lee dreamed that Reuben would apologize for every time he slapped her, every time he punched her. In the morning when Reuben refused to apologize, Mary Lee took $35 of Pleasant Grove money and bought a bus ticket to New York City. She got a job, made friends, went to a Harlem dance club. When her father wrote that it was time to come home, she agreed. And when she did, Reuben apologized. Stories like the one Moringa wrote draw us into the lives of the characters. We feel with them. We cry when they cry and laugh when they laugh. Nothing touches readers like that element of human spirit. Another literary Nobel Prize recipient, author Nadine Gordimer wrote, The best way a writer can serve a revolution is to write as well as he can. The reason to be as a writer and the reason to be as a responsible human acting like any other within a social context. In that same vein, renowned writer Isaac Singer wrote, The serious writer of our time must be deeply concerned about the problems of his generation. Timely writing, writing that addresses social conditions, is an imperative element of great literature. Readers want to know what's happening in their world and how it affects them. One of the masters of that skill and one of the greatest writers of the 20th century was Eugene Patterson. Patterson wrote of the civil unrest that strangled the 50s and 60s in America. His writing was heralded for many reasons, not the least of which was because it spoke of the current climate and issues facing society. Patterson was awarded the Pulitzer in 1967 for his editorial contributions at the Atlanta Constitution, but perhaps his most inspiring piece was one he wrote in 1963 in response to one of the worst acts of domestic terrorism America had seen the Birmingham church bombing that killed four little girls. Patterson wrote, A Negro mother wept in the street Sunday morning in front of a Baptist church in Birmingham. In her hand, she held a shoe, one shoe, from the foot of her dead child. We hold that shoe with her. Every one of us in the White South holds that small shoe in his hand. We created the day. We bear the judgment. Patterson's article swept through the country like a smoke-clearing breeze, opening the eyes of many in the South and around the country. The stories I've covered here were not found on library bookshelves or on bestseller lists. They were all found in ordinary newspapers, but written in extraordinary ways. And they have something else in common. Each has stood the test of time. They've endured. The truest test of literary greatness is a work's ability to endure through years of great writers and great writing. During the 1800s, literary critic Charles Augustine Saint-Bove wrote a piece entitled, What is a Classic? Saint-Bove answered his question by writing, The idea of a classic implies something that has continuance and consistence and endures. No great literary masterpiece falls from public view. They remain and compete with the literature of modern day. All of the works I've cited have captivated new groves of readers every decade. Their relatability and evocative wording stir new readers every day. They speak to the heart and social ills of humanity and seek to enlighten, inform, and entertain new eras of audiences. And they were all just news stories written by journalists that helped paint the canvas of great literature. Thanks for joining me. I'm Pilar Davis.